Hi, all. Thank you for hanging with us for a long afternoon. I, I want to get started because our, our uh, keynote speaker is here. Jeff Hammerbacher has just arrived with the, having to deal with the uh, congestion on the Bay Bridge, which can be just dreadful. Um, but we're really delighted to have Jeff here. Jeff, as many of you know, is the co-founder of Cloudera, and he currently serves as their chief scientist. Uh, he's also an assistant professor in the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, and a director at Sage Bio Networks, which I learned from the internet, is a research institute that's developing platforms and governments to allow biomedical data to be collected, shared, and reused. Uh, Hammerbarker also uh, conceived, built, and led the data science team at Facebook. He was responsible for building, driving many of the applications of statistics and machine learning, as well as building out the infrastructure to support those tasks. He earned an, a BA in math from Harvard. Uh, Tim O'Reilly named him one of the world's seven most powerful data scientists. Uh, and the reason that I invited him, or one of the reasons that I invited him, I've, I've known him for a couple of years because he taught a data science class here on the Berkeley campus. Uh, but I was also struck by the comment that has now, he made that has gotten a lot of uh, PR. He, he said, uh, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. And I thought it might be nice to get him to come and elaborate on that. So with no former ado, more, more ado, just help me welcome Jeff Hammerbacker. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, this gave me an opportunity to break out my old Berkeley slide deck. Uh, I taught a class just down the hall uh, a couple years ago, and it never took uh, almost an hour to get from my house to here. Uh, so yeah, uh, as Annalie mentioned, uh, this quote, uh, which has been used to advertise this conference, I said this uh, a couple years ago, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads, that sucks. I've never actually been asked to um, explain what I meant. So this was uh, her email to me, said, you know, maybe I could start with that observation and uh, talk about other important and societally beneficial applications for data science tools and technologies. So uh, I struggled with how to define societally beneficial uh, <laughs> and important and just decided to kind of ask a lot of questions rather than make a lot of statements. Uh, so hopefully this is uh, of interest uh, to you guys. These are problems that I think about uh, a lot. So to give you some context for that quote, uh, it actually came from a discussion I was having with this reporter named Ashley Vance, uh, who wrote the first sort of major story on Cloudera when he was at the New York Times, uh, and then moved to Business Week when uh, Bloomberg bought Business Week and raided the New York Times uh, tech staff, so people like Brad Stone moved with him. Uh, and he stopped by the Cloudera office one day to catch up about this book that he wanted to write about building a brain. And I thought that was very interesting. And uh, so we just had, we were having this long, uh, rambling conversation about uh, people working on different ways of simulating uh, cognition in silico. And uh, several months later, he just sends me an email saying, oh, hey, my editor needs this story on the bubble in Silicon Valley. Do you mind if I use a few of our quotes, uh, of the quotes that I got during that discussion we had? Uh, and I was like, sure, why not? Um, and then it turned into this uh, piece on me like taking down the tech industry, uh, <laughs> which was kind of surprising because it was you know they were just kind of off the cuff comments while we were talking about a topic that was really interesting to me, uh, trying to simulate cognition. Uh, I, 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 so in any case, it felt a, a bit uh, taken out of uh, context. So there wasn't really any deep. I wasn't like writing a PhD on um, ethics and. Uh, I wasn't sort of like an anthropologist studying uh, Facebook from the inside. I, I was literally just talking about a problem that I found interesting, and he asked me how this related to the stuff I used to do, and, and that sort of came up. But uh, if I had to, I, I am a bit predisposed to um, dislike advertising. So I don't know if anyone's read these books. So I have my liberal arts education to thank for having come across these two books uh, in my education in college. Uh, and these are a couple books. Um, by any, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, I've only read it, Roland Marchand. Uh, and they kind of document how uh, in the early 20th century, American society started to have this adverse uh, reaction to these lumbering corporate conglomerates that were emerging. And uh, these two books kind of chronicle 
uh, how those corporations worked with advertising agencies to craft uh, kind of the consumption ethic uh, and the, uh, the notion that these corporations were heroic and doing great things for American society. Uh, so I, uh, maybe this sort of poisoned my brain for when I uh, ended up out here on the West Coast, but they do a good job of making you think that these corporations and their uh, PR arms uh, did not have the best interests of the consumer in mind. Uh, and it's quite well researched and has some pretty pictures. Um, so I, I thought about why that sucks, uh, that people are all thinking about advertising so much. And I came up with a few different categories of concerns that I have uh, about the uh, proliferation of measurement technologies and data storage technologies and software to analyze data and make predictions. Uh, so so the, the first category uh, that I decided to talk about is just the, the uh, ubiquitous corporate surveillance uh, that characterizes modern society. And I thought this was kind of funny. I went on my Amazon profile. And so I started working at Facebook on April 30th of 2006. And you can see that two weeks in, I bought this book, uh, <laughs> Database Nation, The Death of Privacy in the 21st Century. Uh, so this is, I think that Simpson Garfinkel was somehow affiliated with Berkeley when he wrote the book. Uh, it's a really uh, remarkably prescient book written in like 2000, 2001, uh, where he, he really documents what's going to happen uh, in 10 to 15 years in the future. And I remember reading this book when I was first starting to work at Facebook. And part of the reason I took that job is I was kind of a, a, a weirdo um, privacy nut. You know, I used to protest DRM with Richard Stallman in New York and things like that. And, uh, hung out with Creative Commons people. And uh, so when I first read this book, I thought, well, it's a good thing that I'm, I'm the one at Facebook. Because <laughs> at least there's someone who's, you know, the person who, I guess, you know, has pseudo on this database uh, <laughs> is cognizant of these uh, issues. And so this book's really interesting because it, it, it makes a case, it makes many interesting observations. One of the cases that it makes is that uh, a corporate actor should not be the one to administer our global ID database. That all things being equal, none of them are really good paths, but given that this global ID database is going to emerge, uh, it should probably be owned by the government. Uh, and so it's interesting that in certain societies, like India, they're, they're, the global ID database is going to be owned by the government. And in certain so societies, like America, the global ID database is going to be owned by corporations. Uh, so we're kind of running an A-B test right now uh, on which society uh, is going to do better. Uh, so that was one issue. Another issue, so this picture looks pretty innocuous. It's a car rental stand. Uh, and I, I, I didn't take a picture, but I was recently renting a car in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, where my wife and her family live. Uh, well, where she grew up, she lives in Nina. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it was late at night, and we were in this kind of like weird outpost off of the actual airport to pick up our car. And I looked up, and I noticed there was this camera uh, behind the register. And actually, <laughs> and when we were in, there was like 16 cameras. It was crazy. And I was like, wow, uh, is this, you know, do you guys have security issues? Are they keeping an eye out? Uh, for you guys, and the guy looks at me and laughs. He's like, "Those aren't there for my security." He's like, "Those are there to make sure that I don't steal things." Uh, and it was really interesting how I thought, "Oh, you know, I saw this camera, and I immediately thought there must have been some, you know, corporate overlord thinking that this person. I need to look out for this person and make sure that they're going to be safe." But in reality, the way that the corporate overlord looked at this person was like, "I hope he doesn't steal stuff when I'm not around. <laughs> Let me put in a bunch of cameras to make sure." Uh, so. Uh, these things all make me very uneasy uh, when I think about uh, just how much corporations are measuring about uh, human interactions today. Uh, so we're not really making considered decisions about what gets measured. Uh, so when you think about the camera that's, th so this poor uh, you know, uh, line employee of budget rent -a car has like 16 cameras trained on him. Uh, but I'm sure there's some white collar crime occurring somewhere in corporate offices of uh, budget rent -a car which is going to have a vastly larger impact on the economy. And there are zero cameras trained on that, on that person. So uh, you know, deciding what we're going to measure is like an actual uh, political and ethical choice. Uh, and we're not really, we're making them within the, uh, I guess I'll jump down to one of my favorite topics. Uh, oh, I don't think I put it on this. 
We'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> but so, so the, the decision about what is what we're going to measure has uh, implicit in it a set of you know political and moral and ethical choices uh, that we don't really you know the the reason we set out to to perform that measurement uh, is usually at the behest of some uh, corporate goal, uh, and we we don't necessarily think about all of the the various side effects and how that's going to warp uh, how we live. Uh, another another big uh, issue that comes up when it comes to corporate. I, I actually I flew up to Medtronic uh, about a year ago, uh, this uh, m uh, medical devices company, and Medtronic was kind of in the news a couple years ago because there's this guy who got a. Um, pacemaker put in, and it wasn't working that well, and he, uh, he wanted to get information about how his pacemaker was working, and uh, he had to end up suing the manufacturer, who was Medtronic, to get access to this data, and Medtronic's position was that they owned that data, not <laughs> the person whose you know, like blood it was um, pushing in and out of his veins. Uh, so this, this notion of... Uh, uh, there, there are all kinds of bits uh, being flung off of uh, you know, my body. Right, I just signed some consent form that you guys can put this video up online and things. Um, so there's all. Uh, so you know, I no longer own uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, the bits that are being generated right now in uh, this material realm. So there's all sorts of um, measurement devices being pointed at humans uh, all day and every day, and our ability to uh, to even understand which ones uh, are being pointed at us, and then to reach into the uh, storage systems and ask. Uh, how are you using that, and can I have it also? Uh, is very very limited. So uh, that's a uh, that's a big uh, problem. Uh, and there, there are things like the the blue button initiative and uh, people trying to make tools to export things from your Google <laughs> profiles and and whatnot. Uh, but the the ability to maintain a tether to every measurement taken of you uh, and ask for uh, an understanding of how it's being used and um, and who actually is the legal entity that uh, uh, can, can decide who gets to use it. Uh, we're very under-informed uh, uh, about uh, that problem. Uh, understanding who can access uh, data is interesting. So I have a friend who's starting a healthcare company right now, and his goal is to um, increase price transparency and quality transparency of um, common medical procedures. And he walked up to uh, a company called IMS Health, which is roughly the Bloomberg of uh, medical data, uh, and they maintain this giant database of doctors' prescribing habits. Uh, and they sell, they, the reason why they maintain this database is that pharma companies care a lot about it. So IMS Health makes a lot of money by selling uh, aggregated information about uh, physician prescribing habits to pharma companies who would like to market the physicians. Uh, and so my friend walked up to them and said, hey, I'd like to buy a copy of this data set, and I'm going to generate aggregate results and present it to consumers so they can make a more informed choice about which doctor they'd like to go see. And the IMS health people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, We're cool with showing this data to, uh, to pharma companies that want to manipulate how doctors prescribe uh, medicines to patients, but I don't know about showing it to patients. That's going to blow up our whole business model. Uh, so he's literally in this like nine month long negotiation uh, trying to convince them to give him this data so that he can use it uh, to display to patients rather than uh, to just pharma companies. So once data has been measured, even if we understand who owns it, uh, deciding who can then access that data uh, is also uh, very, very important. Um, there's all sorts of these questions. I don't want to get too bogged down. Um, how can the results of analysis be used is an interesting one that I see in practice uh, at customers at Cloudera. Uh, so one of the things that I've learned is in highly regulated industries like credit cards uh, or healthcare, uh, your predictive models, you have to be able to explain uh, what each feature is in your predictive model uh, because there are certain features that you're allowed to use to make predictions and certain features that you're not allowed to use to make predictions. And that was quite surprising uh, to me and obviously very, very easy to game uh, because uh, it's, it's very easy to uh, you know, create correlation structure between features uh, and have one feature which is really just a proxy for another uh, and that's not written into our laws in any way. So it's, it's interesting how we're trying to control, there has been some attempt to control how the results of analyses are used, uh, but they're, they're quite easy to, uh, to get around. Um, this is one I deal with all the time. When is a corporation subject to the common rule? Like, when do I need? So at Facebook, I was conducting experiments on human subjects all day long. You know, so <laughs> probably some of the large experiments ever conducted on human subjects. Uh, and the reason we were conducting those experiments is because, number one, we wanted them to use our product more. And number two, we wanted to make more money from them. Uh, and so that was cool. I didn't have to talk to any sort of IRB. But now at Mount Sinai, I'm trying to uh, treat patients who have cancer. And <laughs> if I want to collect data about them, uh, I have to go write up this like massive proposal. And so, so 
if you want to sell someone something, it seems like it's totally cool to just uh, collect whatever you want about them and, uh, and experiment as hard as you want, but as soon as you're trying to do something nice to them. Uh, so I, I have a really hard time understanding <laughs> when I'm supposed to use, uh, when I have to talk to an IRB or when I'm not, but the rough rule of thumb I have is if you're trying to help them, you should probably you know, run into a massive regulation. <laughs> uh, and actually, this bottom one's a, 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 a personal concern of mine. Uh, I, you know, you know, one of the things that I remember about growing up in the Midwest in this like pre-internet era uh, was, you know, discovering like-minded individuals because we had all spent time ferreting out uh, interesting subcultures and learning a lot about them, and then finding uh, a, bond, a bonding because like that was like some weird area that we had dug into, uh, and you know, there there are no like safe spaces right now. I feel like for counterculture to happen, uh, you know, like. I'm like an old guy now, and I can observe every sort of countercultural trend happening like immediately when it happens. I just go onto the Tumblr and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. They're now, uh, you know, making these sorts of videos. Um, okay, so it, it feels very, you know, I feel like the speed at which the uh, the monolithic culture is absorbing these uh, subcultures is uh, is increasing at a very rapid rate, and it makes me very concerned because a homogenous world is a is a deeply boring one, and uh, I I have a very strong concern that uh, this corporate surveillance. You know, these, these, um, these channels in which people are acting out uh, their uh, elements of counterculture are themselves owned by large corporations. Uh, and there just doesn't seem to be these kind of empty spaces for uh, you know, people to be people without like cool hunters observing them doing it and then trying to like modify their corporate motto to incorporate what they've seen on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> All right, so corporate surveillance, ubiquitous corporate surveillance really kind of weirds me out. Not quite sure what to do with it. I literally just assume that every action I take today is being observed. I, I don't act in any way, like even when I write in my Evernote, you know, like my personal notes, I just assume that someone's going to read that someday. Uh, I think that's the only safe assumption you can make. I actually have a friend whose emails were subpoenaed for some crazy uh, lawsuit, and his emails are now just the most boring things ever. He just, everything he emails to me is like, thank you, sir, like looking forward to this Friday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like that's like that's how all of our interactions I feel like are going to be soon. Uh, so that 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 concerns me. So the other related to that problem is um, just the corporation as a container for work. Uh, so there's this real you know when I left Facebook, what I did was I started a company, <laughs> and it was a venture back company. And I, I look back now and I'm like, I didn't know there was any other option. It feels like that is uh, just this like teleological, uh, <laughs> you know, the story has been written for every like smart young person who comes out to the valley uh, is that like if you have uh, some sort of good idea or some set of uh, monetizable skill, like you will end up as the founder of a, um, of a Delaware C Corp and, and raise money from venture capitalists. And I, I, I look back now and I'm like, well, was that really the right, I didn't know there were other containers. And I've, I've really been uh, interested to learn about other sorts of containers. So OpenStreetMap is a really cool project, uh, you know, volunteer driven. They just create these uh, Creative Commons uh, licensed data sets um, uh, of geospatial data. And there's just a, a nonprofit foundation that sits to the side of it uh, and in no way is the owner of, but helps facilitate the growth of that. So this is one way in creating a non-corporate cor uh, container to do cool data stuff. Uh, I learned about Canonical actually from Ashley Vance, not about the existence of the company, but uh, its structure. So Canonical uh, is, is interesting. It started by this guy, Mark Shuttleworth, who made a lot of money uh, and decided to um, you know, bring Linux to consumers. Uh, and then what he did is he decided to create a corporation where he said, I'm willing to spend, uh, I want to get this corporation to the point where it brings in $30 million a year and we spend $30 million a year. We're just, we're just going to run this thing break even. I'm going to be the sole shareholder. I don't have to worry about increasing profits every year. Uh, so it's still a C Corp, but it's, uh, it's got a single shareholder uh, and it's administered in a, uh, all he cares about is getting break even. He doesn't care about profits. So that, that was an interesting sort of container to build uh, for people to do work within. Uh, Mozilla is another one uh, that I learned about. Uh, our B-Round investor at Cloudera was Greylock, and John Lilly had recently left uh, Mozilla as CEO to become a partner at Greylock. Uh, and I learned about the corporate structure of uh, Mozilla uh, from him. And it's structured in a way, I guess, similar to how hospitals are structured in that uh, it's a for-profit corporation whose sole shareholder is a nonprofit. Uh, and so that allows them to take uh, donations as well as um, 
generating incremental revenue. So this was an interesting sort of container to build uh, to do work. And then my favorite is um, Applied Minds. Uh, so Applied Minds uh, is a, uh, is this guy Danny Hillis and a couple of other his uh, buds, and they uh, they just built this small consulting agency of like uh, you know a few dozen people, maybe even less, uh, and then they they think about things they'd like to work on, and then they think about which corporate entities might care about that uh, such a thing, and then they work with them to, to, to create some sort of vehicle to allow them uh, to work on that problem, uh, and then in a way that they will be financed by this entity, but the entity will, will gain ownership and things. So things like um, um, Freebase or MetaWeb uh, came out of Applied Minds. And so there are all different kinds of uh, containers that you can build for people to do work within. And uh, so I think it's an interesting question to ask, that, you know, when is a venture-backed Delaware C Corp not the right container for work? Uh, this is not a, you know, this is uh, a question that I ask if, you know, I've done probably 40 or so angel investments now, and this is the first question I always ask, is, you know, is this, why did you choose to do this? What other containers for work did you consider? And it's very rare that people think about anything beyond that in the Valley, uh, which can be frustrating. Um, I've also begun to notice that many corporations don't really need full-time employees these days. Uh, so, so where do we draw the boundary? You know, how the, the Cozian uh, transaction cost theory of the firm, like, <laughs> has that, uh, you know, have transaction costs completely dissolved to the point where we don't really require any full-time employees? If we do require a full-time employee, um, when and why? And then, okay, if we are building products and services without requiring too many full-time employees, how do we compensate those people who are outside of the scope? So some of my investments have massive workforces uh, in like South America through uh, things like Odesk uh, that they structure. And you think about, you know, these guys end up, their company gets bought for like 70 million. And it's primarily on the back of those uh, people working hard in South America, but all of the uh, outcome uh, is going to the equity holders who were the founders. So thinking about uh, if we are, if corporations are no longer a container in which all the people who uh, are doing work which have value for that corporation find themselves within, like how do you allow results to spill outside of that container onto the people who have helped create it? And there was a very interesting post about Coursera recently, and Coursera's <laughs> Uh, asking for volunteers to, to translate their course, courses into different languages. And somebody's like, hey, wait a second, you guys are a for-profit corporation. <laughs> like, uh, so you're just asking for people to volunteer, and people are doing it, and it's like, it's, a, uh, it's, it's kind of messed up. Um, <laughs> so what work outputs should a corporation own? So I'll talk about it in a bit, why, we, why I decided to, to found Cloudera, uh, but I always thought it was really strange that I'd build this team and work really hard to build stuff, and then if I were to ever leave my employer, uh, like all that stuff would just not be mine anymore. I'm like, hey, like, hey we built that. <laughs> you know, like, I want to be able to use that wherever I go. Like, just because you guys you know, gave me free lunches for, uh, and a salary, like, I don't really feel like you should own everything that I did. Um, so thinking about the intellectual property restrictions uh, that are placed upon, you know, now that I work in an academic university, we've got the By Dole Act. So, uh, um, you know, this university looks at me as this like little intellectual property generating engine, uh, and like every every time I, I talk to somebody over there, they're like, "What can we patent uh, about what, what you're doing?" And I'm like, "I'm trying to give it away." Uh, so like I'm literally like exploring strategies for ensuring that the intellectual property I create is owned by some third party entity, so that the the uh, the it's, I guess it's not a corporation, but the nonprofit that I sit within can't just try and like monetize the creations uh, our creations as a lab. So thinking about you know what is the right line for uh, a corporation? What what do they get to keep? Um, Entirely coupled to that is what benefits they provide. So this is kind of one of the things that I try and think about is we've, we've really, the corporation has been bound to this basket of benefits. Uh, you know, we, we just barely carved off healthcare recently, uh, but they do all of these things to provide for, so things like, you know, my dad worked at GM for 32 years. Uh, so, you know, he was kind of the king of, uh, or he, he was part of the a corporation that was the king of providing these benefits to their employees. You know, he's got a pension and healthcare and all this junk. Uh, but does that really make sense? Like, do we really want to be uh, tied to this non-human actor uh, in such a, a, a heavy way? Um, so this is the one that I mentioned in the last slide that I really want to talk about. Occupational ethics, the corporations and gender. Uh, so this, the, so I came to uh, the Valley in 2006 from New York, and the first thing I noticed is everyone who worked for Google is a zombie. 
Like, I just looked around and I was like, all these people are completely uncritical about what Google does. They, they think that everything that Google touches is like ethically superior to whatever anyone else does. And like they, it feels like they just squeezed out any sort of heterogeneity in opinions. Uh, it was very bizarre. These are people that I had known previously to them working at Google. And then starting to talk to them, they're just like, wow. Like they had uh, any sort of perspective uh, on the world had been lost. And you know, I was like, man, I'm glad I'm at Facebook where we have all these independent thinkers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and like two years later, I look around and I'm like, whoa, like we got Googled. Like we like, like everyone I was talking to, like there was, you know, so the way that I described the process of turning from a startup into a company is you take all these different vectors that point in a variety of directions, each with a different magnitude. And so you have this sort of like Brownian motion of a company. And then like as soon as, so you're, you're, you're basically trying to hill climb. And like as soon as you, that corporation finds a hill, uh, the first thing they do is they just start shedding all the vectors that aren't pointing in the direction up the hill. And <laughs> so like, I was just watching as like one by one all these vectors were being shed. And uh, this really got me, um, it was very frustrating because there were people that I had respected uh, and that I had had great conversations with. And I just felt, I, I was just like watching objectivity um, just drain from them. And I've seen it happen even since I left where I'll have a friend who goes to work for them and then like two years later, it's just like you just feel the, the ethics of the corporation like being pushed into the eth ethics of the individual. And there's a really wonderful book on this actually that I found uh, several years later called Moral Mazes, uh, which is this like, it's sort of, I don't know if you guys know, there may be some philosophies of, uh, philosophers of science in here. So if you guys have ever read uh, the book Laboratory Life, it's this wonderful like thick description ethnography of biologists doing science and moral mazes is like the same thing for middle managers. And he just like sits there documenting uh, like all of these crazy things that are happening inside of this like 1970s corporation. Uh, and all of the, he just talks about kind of the fundamental anxiety uh, of, a, um, uh, of a middle manager due to uh, the relentless, uh, what's he called, like prob moral probation. You know, you're constantly being pushed through these decision making cycles in which like your superiors are evaluating, your superiors and your peers are evaluating you uh, as to how close you hew to the corporate ethics. Uh, and so this was, I think the thing that concerns me most about corporations as a container is this, the, the, the fact that an individual's ethics are warped by the corporate ethics and invisibly to most individuals, uh, which is very, um, very concerning to me. Uh, so corporations interfacing with governments, I feel like has been covered pretty heavily in the, um, uh, uh, in the press. Uh, another one I think about a lot is this, um, uh, when does a product become a utility? So whenever I'd sit down with Zuck and he'd explain to me like where Facebook was going, I was like, huh, like, <laughs> Uh, that seems like something that like the government should know. Like this, like you know, aren't we going to run into antitrust laws and, and all those sorts of things? Um, and it, you know, there are other societies that have made the decision. So, so when a product built by a private corporation becomes so ubiquitous that it can be perceived as a utility, that it's fundamental to human society, uh, when does it make sense for that to no longer be owned and administered by a single corporation? Should it be broken up into many corporations, or should it be taken over by the government? Uh, and so there's sort of this, you know, China's a very interesting model of uh, this, this like Ian Bremmer book on like uh, I can't, state capitalism. I can't remember exactly what he calls it. Um, but so there is a model in which rather than just antitrust like smashing corporations, you actually just eat the corporation. Uh, and there's, you know, I was reading um, there's an election going on in uh, South Africa right now in which there is a uh, one of the parties, the, the party which got the third most votes. I think they're called something like the Economic Freedom uh, Force or something like that. One of the platforms they're running on is, uh, you know. Uh, having the government pull in some of these major private corporations that are part of, part of South Africa. Um, so I think that's a, an interesting question that it's no longer, uh, you know, I, I think post 1980s, capitalism had won, communism had lost, and we all knew that like private markets did everything better. Uh, but now we're in this weird world where um, sometimes the private markets <laughs> have been doing uh, worse. Uh, uh, and then I, this is the other most important question for me. So occupational ethics and then how do you kill a corporation? There are so many zombie corporations walking around right now where they, they built a product, they sold it uh, at a very great profit, and now they're just sitting around milking that revenue stream, doing terrible things to it. And I guess that's why the private equity industry uh, exists. But the private equity is, uh, industry doesn't put these things out of their misery. They like revive their corpse uh, and try and like bring them back in the world. So th this is kind of the question that I ask all my friends in the finance industry is like, how do you kill a corporation? How can I make these things go away? There's like some of them just like should stop being around. Uh, so that's uh, a question I have about corporations. It's, it's very unnatural. What other organism, uh, 
There's a there's an interesting book by um, this woman Jane Jacobs uh, who I enjoy reading, and it's called The Nature of Economies, and she talks about um, you know there the uh, if you want to compete, uh, it, competition assumes an arena, and uh, it's no good for an organism to outcompete all other organisms if it also consumes its arena, uh, and this is one of the things that I think is fundamental to the definition of a corporation today is these things seem to consume their arenas. Like the, the whole goal of a corporation is not just to like outcompete other corporations. It's also to just like, you know, like distort the laws around it and, and just like bulldoze its uh, small competitors so that, you know, like there is no chance to, uh, to compete around it. And this is, uh, you know, uh, how could we create containers for work as a society uh, which have a more natural life cycle uh, and aren't destroying the arena in which we've created for them? Uh, seems like a, a pretty interesting challenge for us. Um, so this, this leads me to um, another problem I have with corporations, and that's elite capture. So this is how societies end, basically, is you, know, you get inequality, and the people at the top of the, uh, the food chain warp the rules of society to keep themselves there, uh, and then they start getting dumber and dumber and worse and worse. Uh, and like that, so this is an example of elite capture. So elite capture in a variety of contexts. This is elite capture in the context of a corporation. Uh, executive pay relative to average wages in the US. I love this chart that The Economist did because they just, this really demonstrates how awful executive pay. So this is elite capture. So guess who determines salaries? You know? And guess who gets paid disproportionately more? Uh, and having been in, in large corporations, um, the value of the work that these people are doing is vastly lower than the value of the work that these people are doing. So like, why are there, is their pay being dislocated so heavily? Uh, so that, that's elite capture within a corporation. So this is elite capture within an industry. Uh, so I like it, it's mind boggling to me that people still have like, you know, this, this apparently hasn't impacted the impression of consumers about either of these brands in any way. But like, you know, these brands are like rail, railroad or steel companies who are just colluding to push down the wages of their workers. And it doesn't matter because next year, like all the smartest kids who graduate from Berkeley are gonna go work for one of those places. Uh, so, but so they just, they know, they own the talent pool, so it just doesn't matter. But this is what it looks like for elites to capture an entire industry. So rather than just, you know, distorting wages within a single corporation, this is now elites distorting wages uh, across an industry. And it, we don't have to confine it to just the tech industry, it's the whole economy. Uh, so corporate profits uh, versus average wages. So uh, all corporations in general today are, are churning out more and more cash I, and, and giving less and less of it to their employees. So, uh, so this is enriching capital, this is enriching uh, you know, shareholders and uh, the executives uh, at the expense of the individual contributors. So. Uh, elite capture is a, is a huge, huge issue uh, in our society today. And this is uh, just an example of how uh, our progressive tax system is not quite as progressive as, it was, as we think, because it turns out the richer you are, uh, the better you are at evading taxes. So it's like all these like, chumps making uh, you know, two million uh, a year haven't quite figured it out, but as soon as you reach like five million, you can now afford to pay like really good tax efficiency experts, uh, and they're now reducing your effective tax rate. Now this is complicated by capital gains versus income, et cetera, uh, but it, it really is the case. You know, I know there's kind of this like phalanx of professionals that surrounds every early Facebook employee that's helping them, uh, you know, perform this efficiently in their taxes. So I've, I've like watched this with my own two eyes. Um, so I worry a lot about this. So this guy, uh, I, another name I don't know how to pronounce, Jaron Lanier. Lanier. Uh, you know, he wrote this uh, kind of incoherent book, but he coined this interesting term, uh, siren servers. Uh, so siren servers, in his definition, are things like a Facebook or a Yelp. They are like consumer web products uh, that have been set up and uh, attain a monopoly uh, in a certain domain, so now they uh, they represent you know the mirror world, the digital realm representation of some category of the physical realm, uh, and he makes uh, one of, uh, an uh, the part of his argument that I agree with uh, is that these siren servers are re leading to increased inequality. So we have the classic example of uh, you know 13 people working at Instagram and you know owning uh, like a very large percentage of all photos uh, that are being taken in the world today. Uh, so there are these uh, I, I worry sometimes that the technologies that we're building are facilitating this, uh, uh, this wealth inequality. Um, so how could we use some of these measurement tools uh, and, and data science methods to, uh, to make accountability proportional to impact? So how can we ensure there's a camera in that budget executive's office rather than just in the individual contributor's office? 
Uh, we should, you know, the more studies we can do to probe the psychology of decision making of once you become elite. Uh, you know, there's, there are really interesting uh, psychological studies which show that, like, when you create these artificial power dynamics, how does decision making change in the person who's been placed on top of that power dynamic versus the person who's placed on bottom? And you know, these things are happening in, in, in larger societies. So the more we can do to kind of quantify and understand that, so that we know what to watch out for, uh, that would be better. Uh, social distance is very, very important. So, you know, there's a wonderful talk by uh, Brett Victor that's very popular in the product and engineering realms, which talks about uh, a creator needing to be close to the thing that they create. You know, you need that feedback, uh, that loop. And uh, the people who create society for us are these elites, whether we like it or not. You know, we'd like to think that we live in this like representative democracy, but uh, you know, the, the people at the top of that food chain are sort of by, if you, depends on how you define definition, but sort of by definition, these are the people who are creating the structures of society. And if they're not close to the thing they're creating, then we're going to end up with a shitty society. Uh, so, the, you know, I think anything that we can do to, to try and decrease that social distance between uh, elites and the rest of society will hopefully allow these elites to grant us a, a better society. Um, and then, most important of all, I think that you know the whole, like America is literally uh, you know a, a society which designed uh, was designed because elites had kind of fucked up, and we wanted to figure out a way uh, to to prevent them from doing that in the future. So. Uh, there was still a little bit of you know universal suffrage wasn't quite something that they had uh, wrapped their heads around at the time, but you know they they were heading in the right direction. So I think that uh, it, rather than perceiving like uh, the Constitution as this like fundamental document like the Bible that just shouldn't change and they nailed it and like let's move on, uh, you know like the design of society is sort of the most important problem that we could be working on, and and I think that. Probably the biggest problem you have to solve when designing a society is figuring out a way to ensure that the people who win one round don't get to mess up the rules for all the people who are coming to play in the next round. <clears throat> so this is uh, the last section of my concerns, and I realized I've hit six. So all the fun stuff I was going to talk about, the good things, I didn't get to. Uh, so so um, taking action. So we, we can do data science, and we learn stuff from data, and now we want to like change the world based on what we've learned. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about uh, how we are, how, how certain can we be about what we've learned from data. So this was kind of weird. Uh, this happened a couple years ago. I don't know how many people are familiar with value-added scores. Is that something that this is a fascinating um, linear regression that is performed by uh, economists to try and or social scientists to try and suss out just how good a teacher is. Uh, and it's like a valiant attempt. They're using pretty reasonable uh, modeling tools and techniques to try and suss out uh, whether or not a teacher is good. Now, have they completely nailed it? Definitely not. Uh, however, the, the Los Angeles Times just kind of ran with it. And so they took the output of this linear regression, uh, and they decided they were just going to publish a list of the top 100 value-added math teachers and the bottom 100. Uh, so this is sort of like a, uh, you know, the data science scarlet letter. Uh, and I chose, I, I chose to give the top 100 value added because I thought it would be kind of mean to put the top 100 uh, or the bottom 100 value added. And like, you're like, OK, I get it from one sense, because they're public schools. And uh, if you're sending your kid to that school, you want to know how good the teacher is. Uh, but I worry that uh, this paper is kind of running a little bit too quickly with the results of this modeling exercise. Uh, having built a few of these models uh, in my day and tried to convince people to use them, I'm kind of surprised that people wanted to use them because usually it takes a lot of uh, coaxing and convincing um, to convince an executive to make a different decision based on the output of a model. But in this case, I kind of feel like they went too far the other direction. This made me really nervous when I saw this because there is in no way certainty about the value added score and its ability to truly capture the goodness of a teacher. And I'm afraid that by you know, clothing it in science and sending it out into the world like this, uh, that, you know, we've jumped the gun a bit and we've made these teachers' jobs uh, much harder than they really needed to be. Uh, and they already have a very, very hard job. Uh, so that's figuring out whether or not a teacher is good. And the data is pretty sparse. Uh, so there's this other uh, book that I've read recently that I really, really enjoyed. And so this is Global Warming. So I started thinking one night, I was like, how, how good does data need to be to convince people 
uh, of something. You know, so forget like trying to convince you know somebody at Facebook to change a, a button color from like red to blue. Like this, like what if I wanted to convince someone that like global warming was happening? Like what is you know, like what are the efforts that have gone into that? What are the counter arguments that have been made? Let's find like the most controversial discussion about you know whether or not the data proves something is or is not happening. Let's see what's happening. Uh, and see, see, yeah, I bet there, this is like a cauldron uh, of learning about how to convince people about something with data. And so this vast machine book is, is crazy. You know, we've been putting these weather stations around and, and collecting data about uh, weather systems since like the 1600s, like the, you know, these naval logs from ships flying around. And you know, we've been building these massive simulations uh, of the weather system and progressively making better and better predictions. Uh, so there's like the, the body of evidence that we have uh, for global warming is just like outrageous. Uh, and it's still not enough to get certain people like over the hump. So there's clearly, you know, like I conceive of that problem of saying, okay, when we feel like we truly have enough evidence to be certain about something, then convincing people to act based upon it. I feel that, I feel like that should be something that would is within the scope of data science as a discipline. And clearly we're missing something if like the body of evidence that we've collected uh, for, uh, for global warming being as large as it is, if we're still not able to then convince people uh, of, uh, to, to make behavior change, there, there's sort of this missing link in moving from certainty to behavior change, which uh, I think there's still a lot of um, work that can be done. So in terms of taking action, there's a lot of different questions uh, I have here. Uh, what problems should we be solving is kind of uh, this very basic one. There's this really nice kind of criticism of the technology industry. Um, uh, oh man, I just forgot the guy's name, it starts with an E. Um, but he, he, he coins this term solutionism, which is kind of like uh, Morozov or something. Um, so solutionism is kind of this uh, mindset that you see in the technology industry where it's like, we can do this, so we're doing it. And it's like there's this missing piece there where it's like, we can do a lot of things, but like which one of them should we do? Um, so developing uh, a better instinct around the capabilities of what we can do with data today, but then which problems should we be solving? Like I, I think it would be kind of weird if you, uh, if you, you woke from a coma 100 years uh, after 100 years sleep, sort of Rip Van Winkling up to today's society, and you found out that we had these like massively powerful uh, measurement devices, and we had these vast stores of data about human activity, and you said like, okay, what's in them? Like, what did we decide to point our massively power, uh, powerful measurement machines at? And you know, it's like it's just like big balls of uh, you know like social media data. Uh, it has you know like. The amount of instrumentation, uh, if I looked at the syslog uh, of this laptop right now, I would know more about what's happening inside of this computer than every measurement that's ever been performed on me at every doctor's office in the entire world, right? So like, our human bodies are so poorly instrumented today, and yet our human interactions are just like, you know, there's 500 cameras pointing on every single one of them. Uh, and if I, if I, you know, if I thought about like globally redistributing uh, the measurement devices, you know, dangerously close to some sort of social uh, socialism or communism, but if you know, if you sat back and said, rather than saying aggressively, I'm just going to reach in and redistribute them manually, but if I wanted to build a system which would cause the distribution of measurement devices to be different, you know, like what what would that different, what would we want to, what would we actually want to point them at? And uh, I, I'm pretty concerned that we're not solving the problems with these really powerful measurement devices that we'd actually want to be solving. Um, quantifying certainty of knowledge is another one. You know, like, it's pretty fascinating to think about how non-data uh, uh, savvy people think about what you can do with data. Uh, I think that you know, I read these articles critiquing big data all the time, and they talk about, you know, like, these big data um, zealots are making all these claims for what big data can do. And I'm always thinking, like, really? Because I feel like most of my time I spend telling people, like, no, 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 we can't prove that with data. You know, <laughs> like, there's all, you know, like, every executive who's ever, I've ever worked with has always been like, okay, you know, we're launching this new product. I need to figure out if it, you know, how it's going to affect this part of the site. Something I'm like, well, you know, these are some ways that we could use to figure that out, but we can never be sure. You know, causal inference is kind of an unsolved problem. Um, so it seems to me that the big data zealots are actually the people who lack the knowledge rather than uh, the people who have the knowledge of what you can do with data. Because I'm very, uh, I feel very limited in, in terms of what I think we can accomplish. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll keep moving on. 
so just to give you guys a quick, uh, so based on all of these concerns, how did I translate that? You know, I don't want to just sit around uh, doing nothing and you know, like worrying about uh, how, how awful this world is. Like, I, you know, I want to actually create positive action. Uh, you know, I remember having a conversation. I dropped out of college briefly, and I had a conversation with my mom. I had, I had just decided not to take any of my finals. And uh, my mom was like, that's a weird decision. Um, <laughs> she was like way less calm about it than that. But uh, <laughs> she, you know, she was like, uh, just because you have uncertainty uh, about you know, what you should be doing with your life doesn't mean you need to not do anything with your life. Uh, and so that, um, that always did stick with me. You know, and she, she was like, I, I still know what I want to be when I grow up. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, perspective, and so I feel a little bit like her. So I, I have all this uncertainty about, about what is right, but I still need to act in the world. So some of the ways that I've chosen to act in the world. Uh, so Cladera was something that I wanted to do because, as I mentioned at Facebook, I was deeply uncomfortable about making things and then not being able to use them when I left that beautiful corporate container with all the free food and <laughs> smart people from Stanford. Um, so Cladera for me would be this engine of public good creation. Uh, so I wanted to create a company that took all of these different open source software tools that I was using to store and analyze data and would be this engine of creation and maintenance uh, and improvement for all these different tools. So you know, this is the top list of, we have something like 23 open source projects now that we bundle into our open source distribution. Uh, and so this is a, to me, Cloudera is a project of turning you know, venture capital and Fortune 500 dollars into open source software, i.e. a public good. Um, so I thought that was a worthwhile way to spend my time. And it's been quite uh, successful commercially, uh, sort of unexpectedly. Uh, but I think that uh, Cladera is, um, is something that I, uh, you know, I tried to design a corporation that I wouldn't hate uh, when I got started. And uh, the fact that Cladera creates so much uh, of an actual public good, you know, the amount of open source software that we're generating on a daily basis is pretty awesome. So I feel like, you know, that there are parts of it I still, you know, I, I like company. Um, I still have a hard time dealing with a lot of the internal uh, corporate kind of feeling stuff, but uh, that part I'm very proud of. The artifact we produce. So Sage Bio Networks. This is a nonprofit. Uh, it's been a long road. Uh, they make a few different things. So the, the vision was to take all of these data sets, these biomedical data sets, put them up uh, in some cloud data store uh, and stick a, uh, a bunch of tools on that cloud data store for tracking lineage, um, for access controls, uh, for compliance, with encryption and things like that, and then make this hosted environment accessible to everyone to do data analysis. Uh, so they built this tool called Synapse. Uh, which does a lot of that stuff. It's, it's, it has fulfilled part of the vision, uh, but what's really been hard is realizing that uh, you know not just Sage Bio Networks, but there are probably 500 organizations, all of whom have the same vision, all trying to build the same thing, and so that's been a, an interesting experience. Uh, one of the things that came out of Sage Bio Networks that was really cool is this thing called the portable legal consent. And so one of the things that I've learned about biomedical research is that when you um, pull data off of a human, you have them sign some consent form uh, which restricts the kinds of analyses you can perform uh, on that data and often doesn't allow you to, uh, it often severs that link between the patient and the data after the data has been collected. So you can't recontact the patient for further research. So the portable legal consent is uh, in the same way that uh, organizations like Y Combinator have tried to take legal documents which are common to uh, starting a company and templatize them. Portable legal consent is trying to uh, templatize these consent forms. So when you're doing biomedical research and you need to have the patient sign something to allow you to use their data for research, you can use the portable legal consent and you can know that there was a lot of thought put into what we wrote in there. And we tried to encode in the portable, portable legal consent things like the right to recontact the patient, or things like the ability to use that data for uh, research unrelated to the uh, research that it was originally uh, collected for, as long as you recontact the patient and get their consent. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of best practices around consent forms that we try to encode into this portable legal consent. Uh, and that was a problem that I didn't even know existed, uh, but it's one that Sage has made some progress on. And then we recently merged with this organization called Dream. So this is a very cool organization, uh, which was sort of Kaggle uh, before Kaggle existed for biomedicine. So they run predictive modeling contests in biomedicine, uh, and they've, this has turned out to be one of the more successful uh, subdomains of Sage now. So we merged with Dream and we've been operating a lot of these challenges. And in fact, in my work at Mount Sinai, we're participating in one of those. Uh, so the stuff that we're doing at Mount Sinai, everything we do is uh, open source. 
Uh, it's Apache 2.0 licensed. Uh, so we're, we're trying to take these new tools for data storage analysis at scale, uh, which use open source software, and we're trying to write open source software on top of that, specific to the biomedical domain, to allow people to work with um, high volume data sets that are common in the biomedical domain and to do operations on those high volume data sets that scientists and physicians need to do uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so one of the things, we're actually just presenting this in um, Mainz, Germany uh, right now. There's a member of our lab who's out there talking. So one of the things that we're doing is uh, we're trying to build a cancer vaccine. Uh, so we're, we're trying to take uh, molecular profiling data about the patient and their cancer and see if we can find something which is in the cancer, which is not in the patient, uh, which will get the immune system angry enough to kill it. Uh, and so it turns out that there's a lot of uncertainty in the measurement devices used to figure out which mutations are present uh, in the cancer. And there's also uncertainty in uh, which things the immune system will want to kill. Uh, so there's a number of predictive modeling and statistics challenges as well as data management challenges in this pipeline. Uh, and so we've been working to, to use the software tools that we built at Cloudera uh, to write uh, some additional open source software on top of them uh, to be able to uh, build cancer vaccines. And we're working with the FDA right now to get uh, approval. Uh, so there was a lab already up at Mount Sinai that was working on this problem, so I don't want to give the impression that we kind of like had this <laughs> idea to do it. You know, we hopped in and tried to improve some of their uh, predictive modeling. Uh, but that's, uh, that's one thing that I've been doing. So uh, I will, I'll end it with this slide, I guess, because I don't want to go too much longer. Um, but so in terms of choosing what to work on, so whether it's going to be important or societally beneficial is difficult for me to determine. Uh, I've never really thought about things like that. Uh, when I think about what I want to work on, the first thing I think about is, am I thinking about this separate from work? Is this just a problem that I find like compelling enough that like un, uh, unbidden, my brain is just kind of like you know working through it and thinking about it? And if that is true, then this is something which is roughly unique, I guess. So exchangeability. Uh, this is you know me uh, pulling a. Um, a uh, probabilist term. Uh, uh, so exchangeability is what we would say in probability. Uh, in moral reasoning, you'd, you'd probably say like veil of ignorance or something. Um, but exchangeability for me means, uh, okay, say I work on this problem and I build something which solves it. Uh, does it matter if it's me that solves it? Would I want to live in a world in which someone had worked and solved that problem? Uh, and so I think that's an important one for figuring out whether or not you want to work at a company and things. And that really prevents you from doing things that are just primarily for accumulating capital or some sort of uh, personal benefit. You just think like, okay, if it was in no way, if nothing accrued to me other than the world had this thing, uh, would I want to live in that world? Uh, so that's, that's part of what I think about. Uh, proximity is really important. So what I mean by that is uh, my first job doing data science and practice was on Wall Street. And I was very, very far from the actual work being done. Uh, you know, I was being, the work, the actual work of the bank was totally opaque to me. I was handed this kind of like sliver of a view into what we were doing and I was just told, make a better model for that thing. And you know, like I did that, but I had no opportunity to think about the, the whole problem, uh, that, that that sliver of a problem f sat within. And so I, would, I, I never will work again uh, in a job in which I don't get to think about the whole pipeline of the problem. So like in this cancer vaccine, you know, it annoys everyone at Mount Sinai, but you know, we're thinking about things upstream from us, like the actual uh, how we take the sample from the patient, how we do the sequencing. So we're, you know, our lab's trying to learn about that and, and, and be able to be informed on that part, as well as the part where we actually build the vaccine and give it to the patient. So you know, I never want to be in a place where I'm not allowed to ask questions about that whole pipe and reach in there and make changes if I think there's a better way to do it. So making sure that, and this you know, relates back to that uh, kind of Brett Victor thing again. You, if you're going to be creating something, you need to be, you need to be t in a tight feedback loop with how that thing that you create performs in practice. Uh, and then smart people and hard problems. If, <laughs> if there are other smart people working on it, and I think that the problem is someone, something that like, isn't just going to give in a day, you know, something you can work on for several years, then that's, that's how I think about cool things to do. So I think there's a lot of cool things to do in data science. Uh, you know, pick a complex system and then pick a set of interventions into that complex system and see if you can predict what happens when you intervene in it. You know, whether it's the body, the brain, the immune system, which is really the thing I've been uh, reading about a lot late, uh, lately, the ocean, the earth. There are all kinds of complex systems uh, around this world that are unrelated to advertising, uh, which people are trying to you know, intervene in and figure out what they're doing. So that to me is the fundamental problem of data science, like predicting the outcomes of an intervention into a complex system. Uh, so, so pick one that you think about a lot and uh, See if you can make better predictions about it. All right, so I have a few more things, but I'll just end right there, because it's gone 20 minutes over. Why don't you take this? Thank you for a second. Yeah.
arts education has served you well. If you're willing, could you take a few questions from the audience? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. You got some mics roaming around if anybody has a question. Thanks, Thanks, Eric, a lot for the talk. Um, so you were sort of railing against um, Coursera asking people to translate part of their classes essentially for free. Yeah. How, how should corporations that are benefiting from the open source stack compensate those that aren't employed by that company for their contributions to the open source stack? Yeah, I think, I think the right way to do it is to hire them. Uh, I don't think there's like, there's not a really a good means of compensating people outside of the corporation that I found. Uh, I, you know, we can give them recognition within their employer. Um, that's one thing that we've done. Um, you can give them kind of grants to, uh, to work on the software through things like Google Summer of Code. Um, but ultimately, you know, we hired Doug Cutting because he deserved a share in terms of equity. So is that, is that happening on mass, uh, apart from just a few corporations that are recognizing the role that open source had? Is there a movement of some of the smaller corporations that are benefiting a lot from open source to do that, to, to compensate in various different ways? Or is it just the, the titans doing it? Uh, I mean, I've seen Stripe set up that program to, where you can work on open source for three months uh, in their offices. I actually invested in a company called Binpress, uh, which tries to allow uh, kind of boutique open source developers. It gives them tools for sales and marketing uh, so that they, can, they don't have to pay for the overhead of that. They can just uh, kind of plug into a, a sales channel um, and get data about that. I'm trying to think of things. I mean, yeah, other than giving people, hiring them and giving them equity, I can't think of a more subtle way. I'd be, I mean, I'm open to it. It's an interesting problem. <clears throat> Other questions? To your right. Hi. So I, I wanted to speak to the, the climate issue that you raised. Yeah. So I'm vaguely responsible for developing data science curricula for social scientists and providing tools. And you, you highlighted this really interesting problem it gets a ton of funding, right? But it's sort of pointed at STEM, the STEM end of the problem, the simulation mm -hmm. end. And the question is, um, industry has obviously figured out the immense value that can be reaped from social, social data mining and, and investing there. Just given that you, you've been across these various domains, do, do you have a sense of where to get uh, some traction for really investing in the social side of, of data science. Yeah, yeah, who would um, fund that? I mean, the whole uh, kind of academic funding complex is very opaque and difficult to understand for me. Uh, so, you know, my lab is funded through one rich guy. Um, and that's like a thing that I can understand. The right way to carve out a subset of tax dollars which go towards science. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for how to convince people this is the right thing to fund because I don't really know the people who um, fund things using government money. Uh, it's the people who decide which fund, where the funds go. The people that decide know it. It's just that NSF gets a very small amount of money for social science and a very yeah. big amount. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so let's talk about that, I guess. Physical science versus social science. So that is something I have an opinion on. <laughs> I, try, I tried to only have questions in here. I, I was like, I should avoid making assertions. I'm going to get myself in trouble. And then I just made a bunch of assertions, so probably going to get in trouble. Um, but so physical science versus social science. So I have this thing where, um, you know, I grew up reading all these popular science books, and everything that they were an account of was an account of the hard sciences, the, like physics. and. Uh, then I went to try and use data to make change uh, in the world, and it turns out that the, the things that I was trying to do looked a lot more like social science. So the literature that I found useful uh, w was the literature that came from social science and people who'd worked on trying to do things like causal inference and observational studies, which was like most of what I was doing um, in the scientific domain. And, and I felt like I had stumbled upon this like weird, uh, like a lot had happened, a lot of good things had happened. 
And I think people are starting to notice that. So I think that the, the, the machinery of social science and the machinery of being able to draw strong causal inferences from observational studies has improved quite a bit. Uh, and it's much more important to the world than the tools and techniques from the physical sciences. So there was this period of time in which we said, well, the smartest people are doing hard science. Uh, so let's import those smart people into uh, corporations. And so you know, Wall Street being one of those worlds. And it turned out that the tools um, that they had imported were not that useful in improving business outcomes. Uh, so like, I remember the point when I knew that like, physics had jumped the shark in finance is when I read this book on the gauge theory of capital markets. And I was like, this is really aggressive in terms of you know, taking a really specific theoretical construct and trying to apply it to, um, uh, to financial markets rather than, say, measuring. Uh, you know, what I would see in practice was I'd spend all this time with like, a really complicated stochastic differential equation, model some market, and then I'd hand it to a trader. And then I'd talk to the trader, and uh, he'd say, well, you know, uh, and I was like, well, how are you going to use this? And he's like, well, there's a market of seven people. Uh, the guy from Goldman and the guy from Lehman went to college together, so they always trade with each other. And, so, and I, like, I'm hearing all these things like, wait, like, this seems like the stuff I should be modeling, not this like, <laughs> crazy stochastic differential equation. <laughs> so I kind of have this like, hobby horse that um, the tools that emerged in the social science over the last kind of two to three decades uh, are going to be kind of vastly more important, and that like the kids who grow up in the next generation are going to be reading stories of like great social scientists. So yeah, like they, it was kind of like you know the first they laugh at you, uh, whatever that quote is, like then you win. Like I feel like the social scientists have a lot more to say about uh, how to use data to make change in the world. Like if I wanted to like the value added score, cal like, figuring out whether or not a teacher is a good teacher. Like, which literature am I going to go search in? Am I going to try and create a gauge theory for, for education? Uh, or am I going to try and look into the social sciences literature? And it turns out there's all these people who've studied the hard problem of just teasing out um, these things without being able to do randomized controlled trials. So that one, I guess, I would totally, I would stand up for better funding for social science uh, versus hard sciences. All right. As a social scientist, I just want to say woot, woot. Thank you. I'm sure Jeff will hang around. Yeah, I got a dinner in like. For a reception outside, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.